break out the old habits of doing things. I'm calling you into new things. How you do things, how you do things is going to be different. It's going to be different. You may not like it, but I'm calling you into it. It's for my glory. Oh. To touch the lost, to restore and restorate. your name Bush yeah. you this morning as we play and as you lift your voice in worship let's sing our song to the Lord this morning let's begin to write our song to the Lord this morning community church we're walking into new things step up let's sing our new song to the Lord this morning
As we wait in His presence, I hope you can feel God's doing something this morning. The Holy Spirit's moving. We have a word. Uh, Ken has a word from God He wants to share, and I want you to, I want you to hear what the Spirit is saying. This is what the Spirit of Grace says. This is what God Almighty says. This is what Jesus Christ says. I desire to speak to each of you. Yes, the days of big names and the days of solo ministries are coming to a close. It's my desire to speak to each and every one of you in this room. Oh, I desire to share with you the secrets of my kingdom, the glories of my beauty, the majesty of my power. Don't shrink back from this time. Embrace this time. Run to the moment. I will not disappoint you. Be not afraid. Perfect love casts out all fear. Trust me. Trust me. You that have been broken, you that have been disappointed, you that have been hurt, I desire to heal your wounds. I desire to speak to you. Yea, I've desired to speak to you for days, weeks, months, some of you years. Allow me to come and to heal the broken places. Allow me to come and pour the balm of Gilead, the oil, the salve that cleanses and purifies and heals. I desire to use you. I desire to make you whole. I will do this. Embrace me. Embrace me. For I love you, saith God. Now we can clap for it and move on or we can decide to act upon it. And what I heard was an invitation from from the Spirit of God through Ken. We call that a prophetic word. It's a word of, of knowledge that God wants to move in our lives. And so what I'd like us to do now is just begin to respond to that. And if something moved inside of you with the thought of the God of heaven and earth, wanting to talk to you, wanting to communion with you, wanting to open up and heal and restore, then I invite you to step into worship at another step. In the spirit realm, just take another step. And whatever you were doing before, add one more step to it. Just begin to unlock a little bit of your heart this morning. And let's press in and take all that the Holy Spirit has for us this morning. Let's worship Him some more.
What is worship to you? What is it in the, in a, in the service of a church? What is it when we corporately come together? You know, there's pressures on us many times to try to be good stewards of your time and to not give you more than you want and leave you wanting more than you have. And the difficulty many times for the worship team or for Jerry or even myself is to know what isn't on your heart and what that's what on my heart, what's on his heart. Because that's what matters. And I don't know if you noticed when I came up here, I opened my Bible and I stepped back and started smiling a little bit. I opened my Bible up and, you know, I'm not real hokey, so I don't always go wherever I open my Bible. That's something. But I thought this morning God got my attention. I opened it to Psalm 22, verse 3. But you were holy enthroned in the praises of your people. God's good. Amen. Amen. Have you praised him this morning? I know you've sang. We've sang. There's no doubt we've sang. But have you praised him this morning? Have you praised him this morning? Will you stand to your feet and begin to praise him this morning? If you can stand, if you can't, praise him where you are. But begin to lift your voice this morning. And just begin to tell him how wonderful he is, how much you love him, how good he is, how, how his mercies have been new to you every morning, how he's begun to be your provision like never before, how he's your, your Lord and your Savior and the giver of life to you. And Lord, we give you honor this morning. We worship you, Holy One. We worship you, Holy One. We give you glory and honor this morning. You are worthy of all praise. We thank you that your mercies are new in our lives every morning. We thank you that your goodness is what leads us to salvation and that we look forward to our tomorrows because you're not only God of our todays, but God of our tomorrows and you're leading us and guiding us. We worship you today. Holy Spirit, we welcome you in this place. And we say, pour out your spirit on all flesh like you've done before. So you do it again, Lord God, that we may know that you, you are alive, that you are on the throne, that you have called us, that you have called us and anointed us to change this world. In your name, Lord God, we praise you. We give you honor. We give you glory. And we worship our, our Lord today. We lift our voices to you. And we say you are holy. You are holy. You are holy, Lord God. He's worthy to be praised, amen. Tell your neighbor he's worthy to be praised, amen. God is good. God is good. My goodness.
Well, if that doesn't light your fire, your wood's wet, I guess. My goodness. Can you feel that? rest in this moment guys if you ever wonder what changes people it's this moment if you ever what brings answers to questions that you've heard over and anguished over it's his presence if you've ever wondered what restores a family or sets a call is this no matter what we build unless the Lord builds it we labor in vain we can try to build better marriages and we should try but it takes the Holy Spirit to make a home we should try to study and show ourselves approved for the call but it takes the anointing to shape a destiny and today I believe today there's some people in this room being ministered to by the Holy Spirit Do you value this presence? At the very back of your bulletin, we added in a, a little statement. And I think it deserves some explanation or warrants some explanation. It's our desire as a body that we lay the framework now and the infrastructure now for the promises of God because God's promises are not for today they're not limited to today they're for tomorrow and what's coming and God has called us to be a training center he's called us to be a catalyst for moving I don't know why he picked Orange Texas I do not know why he he chose to use he chose to use us. I'm just honored that he's going to. Apparently it's because we have a lot of boxes of tissue around here. All of a sudden. <laughs> but to that end, we know that we have functioned as a family for a long time. And as a family, it's built around our trusting one another. It's built around our relationship. But I want you to close your eyes for just a moment. And I want you to imagine that the promises of God begin to come true in a very tangible way. And some things he said is that the, the wealth of this world is laid up for the righteous. And I want you to imagine that the plants begin to expand at the rate that they've predicted and the Gulf Coast begins to grow the way it's been predicted and the real wealth in the kingdom of God is not on the oil that's produced or the chemicals that are refined or the money that's made but in the souls that come and I want you to imagine he begins to send people into this body into our community and some of them talk with a Middle Eastern accent some of them have different cultural backgrounds than we do. Many of them will come and we will not know them well outside of the Holy Spirit and the brotherhood of Christ. And we want them to come in and we want them to learn 
how to flow with the Spirit of God and how to trust that what they experience is not based on a a familiarity that we have with one another, but a standard that we find in God's Word. And to that end, I've asked, and the board has, has graciously allowed me to put into the bulletin something I found that Dutch Sheets had and some other men and women of God that I admire that have learned how to host and flow in the presence of God. It's really just meant to allow us to grow. And when there's more people here than, than what we've grown up with, they can trust us and we can trust them. That we'll honor the flow of the Holy Spirit and we'll have the order that the Holy Spirit deserves to speak into lives. I think this morning you saw an example of that. And so please don't see it as a need to control or even to limit, but just as an opportunity to make sure that we have an infrastructure that allows us to grow. Because I want to work on it while we're small enough as a family to do it so that when we're, when we're so big that we're sending missionaries out around the world that we don't have to try to reinvent the wheel at that time. Amen? So are you okay with that? Do you, are, you, are you able to support that, I hope? Thank you. You know, the Lord Jesus, when he was teaching, he, he was talking to the disciples, and he ended the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 7. Uh, and he said something in Matthew uh, chapter 7 that is really astonishing. As he talks to them about how to interact with each other and and what the Holy Spirit uh, does in our lives. He begins to unfold what the kingdom of God is like. And, and how not to be judgmental. And how to, to give beyond what people ask of you. But then Luke begins to record the same message. And almost in a parallel scripture. In, in Luke chapter 7. Once again, we find Jesus talk about the, the, same, the same kind of things. About our need not to judge one another. About our need to love one another. And our need to, to trust what the Holy Spirit does in our lives. And through this process, I want you to look at what the Holy Spirit might be saying to us this morning. I was looking at seven, it's, it's actually six. Luke six. I want you to hear, he says, Judge not, and you shall not be judged. Condemn not, and you shall not be condemned. Forgive, and you'll be forgiven. So in this context of how to work with one another, and how to love one another, and how to live free, he takes it another step further. And then he says something that seems out of context maybe. Give and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over. Will men will be put into your bosom. For the same measure you use, it will be measured back to you. So whether it's forgiveness. Whether it's the lack of judgment. Or whether it's giving. God says... We hold the very instrument of how it will be poured into our lives. How many of you love the fact that you're forgiven this morning? Amen? I love that. And so I want to I wanna, I wanna measure, have a big measuring cup of forgiveness. Because I know I need that in my life. And I want to learn to be more gracious with my judgments. And so I want to I want to learn to use a different standard than what I've used in the past. And then today I think about giving in that same truth we talked about it a couple weeks ago. That we have opportunities to give, and every time those opportunities come, we are determining how God pours back into our lives or how other people pour into our lives. Community Church has been blessed 
in such a phenomenal way. I want you to think about the people that we have. Look at our worship team. Aren't we blessed? We have wonderful facilities. We, we got to have 600 people watching a movie one weekend, 350 showing up last night for Chester's God's Outdoors. God's given us so much. And I want to begin to ask us, are we stretching giving back to Him? Are we resting on, on our forefathers and the people who have gone before us, giving and sacrifice? I know we've inherited so much, but are we willing to sow at an incredible rate? Now, I'm not just talking about you writing a big check. That's great, but that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about are you willing to sow at a, at a level that will stretch you immensely? Are you willing to sow your time? Are you willing to sow your love? Are you willing to sow forgiveness? Are you willing to sow friendship to someone who's not very friendly? Are you willing to sow forgiveness to someone who's not very fun to be around? Are you willing to be stretched? Because I believe God's calling us to a season of stretching. And I believe this is the great thing that when God stretches us, He's just trying to make our containers bigger. Amen? You ever been stretched? Oh, some of you not paying attention this morning. You checked out on me. Any of you been stretched out here? Amen. Well, there's going to be a special business meeting uh, in a couple of weeks, uh, April the 13th. Uh, we're going to, the board and myself have asked that a special meeting uh, be planned uh, to deal with the property at 1911 16th Street. That's our drive center. And we'll need a quorum uh, of members will be needed. It'll be immediately following the morning service. And I would ask that between now and then, you be in prayer for it. Uh, I'll be able to give more details a little bit later as more details come together. But God's doing some great things. He's given us favor in our community. He's uh, some things that caused us to be here uh, on Martin Luther King were because we weren't able to do some zoning things on 1911. And because of the board's heart and the staff and the city meeting together, it looks like some things are beginning to move that will be a great benefit to our body and to our community and to the churches around us. So be in prayer as we, as we move closer to this meeting. And uh, please uh, make an effort to be here for that. Uh, we come to the part of our service where we look at our offering. And uh, we have a declaration that we make. And I want you to think about this declaration. How many of you, as we've been declaring and looking at God's, has that declaration stretched you? Has anybody been stretched by the declaration? I have. You know, I started reading it and I declared, checks in the mail. I thought, well, God, I don't want to be selfish. And I declared that we would have favor and find money and, and that we would get our debts paid off. And I'm reading it and I'm, I'm really acting in faith because I'm going, God, I believe this is you, but this stretches me a little bit. And over the past two months as we've been doing it, I've been hearing testimony after testimony of people who have done exactly that, received checks that they didn't anticipate, had debt paid off faster than they ever anticipated, found favor and promotion. And I began to discover that really what we're declaring is not our desire for God to do. We're really agreeing with Him what His desire is to do for us. So as we declare together, maybe you've struggled with the same things I've struggled with. And so will you step out in faith, not declaring out of a selfish motivation, but declare the Lord's heart over your life. So that what gets to the end of that, his kingdom can expand. I pray that every check we get in the mail will be used to expand his kingdom. Every debt that's paid off will be reallocated to expand his kingdom. Every favor that we have opens up another opportunity to expand his kingdom. Will you declare with me this morning, if you put it up on the screens, our declaration. As we receive today's offering, we are believing you, Father. For heaven opened and earth invaded, storehouses unlocked and miracles created, jobs and better jobs, raises and bonuses, benefits, sales and commissions, estates and inheritance, interest and income, rebates and returns, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, 
debts paid off, expenses decrease, blessings and increase. Thank you, Lord, for meeting all of my financial needs, that I may have more than enough to give into the kingdom of God and promote the gospel of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Amen. Ushers, will you stand and take up the offering, please? I'm lost without you alone. The sea is the air I breathe. The sea is the air I breathe. And your holy presence, oh, living in. is my daily bread This is my daily bread Your very word All is spoken All to me without him. Amen. You know, we've been talking over the last several weeks about the character and nature of God. We've been talking about the idea of what it means to live in an in a interactive relationship with the Holy Spirit, with a recognition of what Christ did for us, 
uh, as he came to be the good shepherd. He said, I am the good shepherd. He, he said, I'm the door. He said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. I'm the resurrection and the life. I'm the alpha and the omega. Jesus. God the Father being the, the Abba for us, the, the one who loves us with everything that he is. And we say things like, God is good. And we, we, it resonates with us. And we're glad that he's good. Aren't you glad that we serve a good God? Amen. I mean, aren't you glad he's not capricious? He's not, he's not fickle. He's not moody. You know, if you ever grew up in a, a, around someone who is moody, anybody know anybody who's moody? Don't elbow them, but like, do you know someone who's moody? And it just changes all the time. One minute it's good, one minute it's bad. Uh, so we just, we, we never know what to expect. And so we never know when someone's kind of moody, whether they're going to, uh, have a smile on their face or have a sarcastic word where they're going to bless us or curse us. And yet we know God is not subject to his moods because he by nature is good. So he's always, because he is good, he's always in a good mood. He just lives. Why? Because of Christ. Because Christ shed his blood on the cross and, and covered the sins of the world. God didn't have to carry around any any feelings of this is wrong and you know the old testament god had a was always trying to fix his kids and his followers and giving them blessings and curses and teaching them and they were always messing up and he was always having to correct them but through christ he came and he redeemed us and he he changed us and he called us to be his and he set us here now to be the influence the influence of the holy spirit around us in the lives of people, because he wanted to show his character and his nature of loving us and being good toward us. And so it took that, that need to, to correct and to be harsh away. And so we see with God in the New Testament revealed by Christ, a God who heals, a God who loves, a God who, who calls us to be his own. And by the Holy Spirit, we find that, that access. And so today we're going to finish up this series and I'm going to call it Living Under the Influence. All right? Living un Now some of you don't get that confused with driving under the influence. So that's different. Okay? But Romans chapter 8 verse 14 says, As many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the what? Sons of God, the children of God, sons and daughters of God. Are you led by the Holy Spirit you know, we want to all say, yes, I'm led by the Holy Spirit. But if you're honest, sometimes you're going, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't know. I, I, I want to be. And we've treated being led by the Holy Spirit like some secret code. Like you've got to get your box of Lucky Charms out and find the secret decoder ring so you can figure out what it is that the Spirit of God's saying. And we get our little Lucky Charms and we try to figure out if we've got the right lens. And, the right, and we don't know. And we, we get frustrated because we know we're supposed to be led by the Spirit. And yet we don't feel many times led by the Spirit. We don't act many times led by the Spirit. And so we start looking to other people. And, you know, we always kind of assume other people are more led than we are and have a better connection than we do. And so we look to people and we begin to make them our heroes in the faith. Well, I want you to know the heroes in the faith didn't always get it right either. You know, what, it, it, being led by the Spirit is not about getting it right every time. Being led by the Spirit is developing a relationship, developing our, our spiritual hearing so that we can interact with God, that we can hear from heaven and be led by Spirit. And, and so I want you to begin to think about it. Ephesians uh, 5.18 says, Do not be drunk with wine, with you, which is dispensation or something like that. I say the word wrong every time. Say it again. Dissipation. 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 <laughs> Say it again. I'll get it wrong again. But be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, I want you to think about, we do have uh, in, our, in our society uh, DUIs, don't we? You ever read through the newspaper, or get on KOGT so you can pray for those people while you read about who it was? You know what I'm doing. You know what I'm saying. Kind of wanting to see what the, the news, the scoop, who got in trouble for what, who's getting married, and uh, who died. And then you get down to who did what, the who done it part. 
and you see people's names and they DUI, driving under the influence. Why does Paul tell us do not be drunk with wine, which is the word Bill said, and be filled with the Holy Spirit? Because whenever we give ourselves to something to influence us, we've given ourselves to it. And so he's saying, give yourself to the Holy Spirit. Give yourself over to the influence of the Holy Spirit in your life. And I want to ask you, how, what things do I give myself over to? What do you give yourself over to to influence you? You know, I'm amazed at watching sports in Southeast Texas. I grew up here so I can make fun of us. It's not like I'm not from here. But we will lose our ever-loving minds over a, a goal scored, a, a ball hit, or a touchdown made. Won't we? Grown men will jump up and down like little girls and their voices will get high-pitched like mine when I get excited and start doing crazy things. We'll stand at the fence with our fingers through the fence, white-knuckling it like we can make it a difference. Why? Have you ever felt like something else was in control of you? You ever made a, a fool of yourself before and thought, what did I do? My mama, God bless her. You know, anytime you add God bless her, you're about to say something bad. Bless her heart. My mom was the fastest person. Any speed I had, I didn't get from my dad, I got it from my mom. Because my mom could keep up with me running down the football field. I couldn't escape her. Every time I'd, I'd look over there, my go, go. Running up and down the field like a crazy woman. Why? And she would run over people. Because she's, she's not looking, she's looking at me, and she's just plowing over children and old people. And later, she, I don't know why I did that, I'm so sorry. And if you know my mom, when she does something, she apologizes for 15 years afterwards. And she's, oh, I'm so sorry, why? Because we, it consumes us. We get excited. And we're called by Paul to say, be under the influence of the Holy Spirit. Let him consume you. Let him excite you. Let him be the one that influences your life and your behavior. And he gives a crazy dichotomy between being under the influence of alcohol and under the influence of the Spirit. What are you giving yourself over to? And what does it look like when we give ourselves over to something to where we actually believe that heaven is giving us information? Do you know how crazy this sounds to the world around us? God's talking to us. And because it sounds crazy, we want to call it a mental illness. Well, I think there's some medication to stop that. God talking to you business. And because the church has allowed the world to define what it looks like, we backed away from it to where we live our lives not really listening to the Holy Spirit. I wonder how much of our churches would change if you just took the Holy Spirit out of the picture. Would it change the way we did church? Or would we just do the same thing and not really notice? Or would we go, whoa, something's wrong? What is it? What is it that we gain when the Holy Spirit is a, is a part of our lives and we're, we're hearing Him? We've got to first figure out how we hear Him so we can learn to be under His influence, right? Now, our bodies are kind of built to be receptors of information and reactors to information. Uh, we, we've got a body of flesh. Everybody got hands? Wave your hands because I can tell you're getting tired on me. Wave your hands. Don't get too crazy. Don't get charismatic because you'll hit someone next to you. Wave them like a good. I was about to say it, then I, I gotta, I'm going to get in trouble. I heard someone say, don't do it. They know me. And so we, we touch, we feel. You know what? That's how we, we, our body feels. And you know you're being led by your body, your flesh, when you're reacting with emotions or with appetites. We're listening to our flesh now. I want that. I need that. I want more of that. If you put me around a chocolate cake, it's not the Spirit of God saying, eat it, eat it, eat it. 
It's my flesh going, that looks great, eat it more. If I go to a restaurant or someone's house, the first piece is just to satisfy my appetite. The second piece is for my enjoyment. Uh, is anybody else like that? You eat the first piece so quick, you go, Where did, what happened? Is there another? Why? Because my appetites, my, my body's in control, my flesh. Well, the Holy Spirit came to help us learn what it means to be redeemed. And that it doesn't have to rule us like that. And then, some of you are very analytical. Your reasoning, your mind, your, your will, and everything's got to be logical. And community church freaks you out. You can't figure out why you come back sometimes. Because it's not always logical and it doesn't make sense. And they're waving the flags again. And they got up and did that again. And they walk across. And you're, you're reasoning, you're computing. And you go, it does not compute. And what's happening is you're trying to figure it out. And it won't match. And you're ever trying to put a square peg into a round hole. And we rely so much on our understanding that we can create. And, and that's how we feel. We work through it. Well, the Bible tells us lean not into our own understanding, but in all of our ways acknowledge Him. And so there's a time when God says, you may not be able to reason what I'm doing, but there's something still drawing you. Have you ever felt like something was still drawing you even though it didn't make sense? You ever got married? <laughs> something is drawing you, go, I, I want to, but wait a minute, I'm going to have to... I've got to share all my money with someone else. I've got to ask them if I can go fishing anymore. I've got to, yeah, this is a good, God's laughing at us. I mean, I really believe marriage is kind of like God's joke on us sometimes. Because he takes a man who thinks and feels a certain way and a woman who completely thinks and feels differently and says, y'all get together and make house and be holy for I am holy. And he's up there elbowing Jesus going, watch this. <laughs> They've given me problems for 10,000 years. So let them have a little fun now. What? And we're trying to figure out, have you ever been a man trying to get into a woman's head and figure out what's going on? Or a woman trying to get into a man's head going, what is he thinking? Right? We can't always get there through reason, can we? And yet we know the Holy Spirit, God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the Godhead, has every emotion, every logical thing contained within it. And there's parts of God that thinks like a woman. We go, I, I don't know all this feely stuff. I don't, I don't need all that feely stuff. And God goes, yeah, you do. And we go, no, 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 God. Father, Father, not Mother God, Father God. But yet that tenderness that we don't always understand still comes from the heart of God. Right? And so our reason backfires sometimes. And then where I believe the Holy Spirit starts working immediately in our lives is our conscience. I was listening to a, a, a message from Miles Monroe, uh, no, Creflo Dollar. Uh, while I was on vacation, and he talk, was talking about the Holy Spirit. I love it when we start talking about something, and you find out other places are talking about the same thing. You know, God's up to something. Well, he's talking about the Holy Spirit and how we think and how we learn to interact. And he says a statement that at first I was like, you can't say that. He said, I don't believe anything happens in the life of a Christian without God letting them know first, good or bad. And I'm thinking about all the bad stuff that's happened to people I know and going, man, how can you say that? He said, I want you to think of this. You've got a God in heaven who loves you more than anything. He loves you so much, he gave his only begotten son. He died for you. That's how much he loves you. He knows things before you know them. And you're telling me he won't tell you? He said, if Christians would learn to hear better, they would probably avoid almost every heartache in their lives unless God said, this heartache is for a purpose. But you would go into it knowing it, not surprised by it. How many times did the apostles get called into uncomfortable situations, but they knew about it first? They weren't blindsided. They went there knowing it. And so he was really challenging me, and I'm listening to him. And, you know, he, I argued with him, but he wouldn't pay attention. He just kept preaching. And so you start thinking about this. And I think about our conscience and how, where I think God starts talking to us because it's the most sensitive and we have what we call a guilty conscience. You know what? When our conscience, before we're redeemed, it's really more reactive than anything. 
It's like, oh, I should have helped that. I should have done that. Why didn't I do that? I should have done this different. But when the Holy Spirit becomes resident in our lives and begins to lead us, I believe he starts wanting to be proactive in our lives. And he starts talking to us about, go do this, go do that, go do this. And we start thinking, oh, did I eat something weird? I, that's just not me. I don't like going there and doing that. You know what I'm talking about? We're learning to hear the voice of God. We're learning to live under the influence. So let's start a little journey and find out what it means to live under the influence. How many of you like to live under the influence of the Holy Spirit in your life? Amen? Give God a hand if you want to live under His influence. Okay, you've just told the Holy Spirit you're ready to live under His influence, right? Well, let's look. Let's set this up a little bit. I'm not going to have you turn there, but in Acts chapter 10, Peter has a vision. And he's, he goes up on top of his roof to, to meditate, to spend some time with God. Meditation is not a new age concept. It's a biblical concept. You don't empty your mind, you fill your mind with the things of God. Whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things of good report, think on these things. Uh, so he, uh, Peter goes up onto the roof to begin to think about these things. And this, this uh, sheet from heaven comes down with all these kind of foods. And they're not clean foods. Uh, they're pigs or different things that a good Israelite would not eat. And the Lord, the voice of God, the Spirit says to him, uh, get up and eat. And he says, huh, not so so, Lord, you ever said not so, Lord? Uh, you know, the problem with obedience is it doesn't allow for no Lord in it. And, and he says, not so, Lord. So it happens again, and it happens again. Finally, he gets up going, well, I had a V8. I guess God's trying to talk to me. Do not call those things which I call clean, unclean. And then in, uh, Cornelius sends a servant, and he goes at the end of, of uh, chapter 10, I think around verse 44 through 48, he begins to, they go into Cornelius' home, and while they're speaking to them, to Cornelius and his family, they begin to be filled, the Bible says, with the Holy Spirit, and they begin to speak in tongues, and they begin to respond uh, to the Holy Spirit in ways that the, the, uh, the good Israelites did. And Peter's kind of freaking out because he's going, whoa, whoa. They received the promise the same way we received the promise. And he wasn't expecting that. It wasn't on his radar. And see what happens when we, they, you get to a place where the Holy Spirit begins to challenge us. When you hear the Holy Spirit, when you live under the influence of the Holy Spirit, He will challenge you. Say that with me. He will challenge me. Say it again. He will challenge me. So many times the Holy Spirit comes in here and says, I don't like those people. I can't tell you how many times ministries have been birthed out of people who didn't like a certain group of people. See, first they get under your skin. Oh, I don't like those, those beggars under the bridge. They're always begging for food. They're always holding a sign. We'll work for food. If they had worked for food, they'd have food. They wouldn't be holding a sign. They're not working for food. I'm working for food, and they're taking it from me. That's how it starts out, right? If a man eats by the labor of his sand, sweat of his brow. I'm not, I'm not giving in to ungodliness. No way. The Lord, Holy Spirit just told me, don't give him a dime. Roll up your window. I tell Mary Beth, don't do that, but never mind. She's the giver. I'm not. And so she, she, uh, the Holy Spirit talks to us. And I can't tell you how many people that started out there began feeding the people under the bridge and the, the ministries come out. Of, because God challenges us. He lets us see something we don't like and then says, now what are you going to do about it? I don't like this. How many of you got something you don't like? Do not point. You got something that you go, that's not right invitation of the Holy Spirit is knocking at your door. What are you going to do about it? What are you going to do about it? There's a challenge. In Acts chapter 15, we get what's called the Jerusalem Council. They get together because Peter has reached out to the Gentiles and he didn't know what to do with it. Paul, he has his name changed from Saul to Paul, the uh, Damascus Road experience. He begins to be what he calls an apostle to the Gentiles. Now these non-Jewish people are coming to Jesus and you're not supposed to do it. They're cheating. They were supposed to become a Jew first. Then they could become part of the way they're cheating, but they have the Holy Spirit the way we have it. This isn't right. The Holy Spirit will challenge you because he sits and says things like he wants us to, to think about it and, and reason together and begin to 
ask ourselves some questions. And in Acts chapter 15, we see where verse 28, the apostles are speaking. And they're making a a statement for the Gentile believers. For it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things. And he goes on to describe what they wanted the Gentile believers to do and abstain from. Sexual immorality, things strangled with blood, idolatry. Basic things to serve the one true God. But see what it says, for it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. That's what the relationship requires. That we can look into the lives of people around us and say, we struggled with this challenge, but it seemed good to the Holy Spirit. Can you say that in your life? What I'm doing, I'm doing because the Holy Spirit and I have been talking. And it seems like a good idea to him, and we agree with him. That's what they were saying. How intimate are you with the Holy Spirit? You begin to be intimate when you begin to be challenged. You begin to go, whoa, that's the Holy Spirit told me. He's being proactive. He's stretching me in my life. But he also, he guides us. In the Macedonian call, we see where Paul is guided by the Holy Spirit. And we look in chapter 16, and, and Paul is going through the land, and he's looking for a place to preach. Paul knows this. I'm going to share the gospel. I'm going to speak concerning the gospel. And it says that he got up, and the Holy Spirit forbid him from preaching, preaching in Asia. So he's going, and he says, I'm going to preach. I'm going to go to Asia. I'm, I'm going anyway. And he said, nope, you're not going to Asia. Hmm. Okay, well, I'm going to go and I'm traveling. Oh, I'm going to go to Trails. He said, no. But while you're there, he begins to have what the Bible calls the Macedonian call. Where the Holy Spirit told him no. As he traveled and he shut doors while he traveled. So the Holy Spirit not only challenges us, but the Holy Spirit guides us and directs us. Now, how in the world could he differentiate between all the other times that were yes because he was going to do something good. I was going to go to Asia and spread the gospel. I was going to go to Pergia and, and spread the gospel. But now here at Trails, you're, going to, you're, you're just giving me no's. But this is my heart. Have you ever wanted to do something for God and it didn't seem to be opening up for you just yet? You ever had great ideas for God? You ever dream big for God? And you're like, if you would just agree with me on this one. I could use a little help here. Well, that's where Paul was. And yet he had a, had a vision. And in chapter 16, it says in verse 9, And a vision appeared to Paul in the night, and a man of Macedonia stood and pleaded with him, saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. Now after he had seen the vision, Paul knew what the Holy Spirit wanted. And he went on this call, the Macedonian call, maybe the most productive of all Paul's mission journeys. He went to Greece. Macedonia was Greece. He went to Greece, which unlocked Rome, the Roman Empire, which unlocked the, the movement of the gospel around the known world at that time. Paul's greatest missionary journey came after he heard no twice. Now, what if he had given up after he heard once? Or what if he said, the Holy Spirit would never say no to sharing the word in Asia. That's just, I get thee behind me. I'm going anyway. See, he had to hear. And so we, we must learn that part of us that learns to hear the Holy Spirit, to be guided by him. And we learn that by being filled with the Holy Spirit. Once we're filled with the Spirit, we begin to be led by Him. We begin to hear Him. Revelation chapter 2, Jesus is speaking to the churches, uh, the seven churches, and He says, He who has an ear, let him what? Hear what the Spirit says. We need to hear what the Spirit is saying. And so how do we do that? We begin to train ourselves to hear what the Spirit's saying to us. In Luke, Jesus said, If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more the Heavenly Father, give the Spirit to those who ask. 
Are you, have you asked? And it's not really that you're asking for more than the Holy Spirit in a sense. The real is you're asking for the Holy Spirit to have more of you. You're asking to live under the influence. And then you're beginning to realize that he's going to start redeeming your mind. And so you begin to meditate on those things that are good and pure and lovely because you want to do your part to tune your, your reason in with him. And then you want to begin to train your body. And so things like the disciplines come into play. Fasting, uh, reading your Bible, prayer. Uh, those things where you've got to kind of set yourself apart to accomplish them. Why? Because you're training your body to respond to the Spirit of God. And then Paul talks about the difference between godly sorrow and worldly sorrow. One that leads to life and one that leads to death. He, he talks about our conscience. He, he's saying there's a place where if we get and we begin to hear that voice and we begin to respond to it, we train ourselves to respond to it. Here's my challenge this week. Do three things. Do something to train your body. To not go on its appetites, but go after the Spirit of God. You know, the Catholic Church during this time does Lent. And they eat fish on Fridays because they, they don't, they're, they're, get, they're not eating the other meats and things. Because they, they want to say, I want to do something. And we look at them and go, boy, it's good to have grace. We don't have to do any of that. We've had so much grace we don't fast anymore. We've had so much grace we don't have to read our Bibles anymore. We've got so much grace we don't pray anymore. We've got so much grace we don't got to do nothing. But what if we looked and said, wait a minute. Grace is not meant to be an opportunity for my flesh to have a party. Grace is meant to be the empowerment to do what the Holy Spirit would have me do. So because of grace, I'm going to miss some meals this week because I'm going to teach my body how to be submissive to the Holy Spirit. I'm, because of grace, I'm going to spend a little bit more time praying this week than I, than I normally would like to because, you know, I can't pray over 15 minutes a day. Well, maybe you ought to go for 16 and just wreck the world. I can't memorize scripture. Jesus wept. You can't remember that? How in the world do you know all the uh, baseball players' batting averages and how many yards that guy gets? You can't remember scripture? At some point, we got to tell our flesh, flesh, line up behind the spirit. And then you begin to think about your mind and you say, wait a minute, I need to do something with my mind to get my reasoning right because I, I've been leaning on my own understanding and I haven't been acknowledging him. I've got myself into bad situations leaning on my own understanding. Anybody else? Because I can even manipulate scripture to get what I want. And so, I step back and I begin to meditate on those things that are good and pure and lovely. Philippians 4.8. I began to spend some time in silence and solitude saying, Father, speak to me. Holy Spirit, speak to my heart. And then lastly this week, so I want you to do something for your mind, your reasoning. I want you to do something for your flesh so your body doesn't get its way all the time. Kick yourself in the pants and get up earlier. Okay? Do what Jack Hayford said. He said, I don't turn off my nightstand light till I spend time with God. So get it, one, get, get it sometime. And then... Be radical. Here's the biggest part. You ready? How many of you love God? Rave your hand if you love God. Get a little excited up there. Some of you, there you go. Yeah, yeah. Some of you are like, this little lot of mine. I want you to do this. You ready? I want you to trust that you love God. Right? You just said. Some of you kind of put the whole thing in. Some of you kind of. I love God. My heart is to love God. Then I'm going to trust that still small voice. I want you to take a risk this week. Whenever the Spirit says something to you, I just want you to say, okay. You may think it's your conscience. You may think, why am I even thinking that? You may get to the stop sign and you hear turn left. And you go, but I'm going right. Just turn left anyway. Aren't you small? You can get around. Okay. Just do something and you may get it wrong. Oh. Or you may get it right. 
See, it's not about getting it right or wrong. It's about saying, Spirit of God, fill me up. I want you to have more of me. I, I'm expecting you to speak to me. And he may say, buy someone a lunch. And you go, I don't have any money for that. Okay, I'm going to go to the debit card. And you get that cramp. <laughs> it may be have a cup of coffee with someone. It may be call someone. It may be write a letter. It, just don't overthink it. I think we overthink when the Holy Spirit starts with our conscience. So can you do three things this week? Do something to remind your flesh that the Spirit's leading your life. Do something to remind your brain, your mind, that the Spirit is leading your life. And do something that responds to your conscience when the Holy Spirit begins to speak with that still, small voice. And that's called taking a risk. Because that part's proactive. It's not reactive. Can you do that? Amen. Let's stand to our feet this morning. Father, we worship you this morning. This morning we give you praise, honor, and glory. We thank you for what you've done. And we thank you that you have poured out your spirit into our lives. We dedicate this week coming up to you. And we say that we are going to bring our bodies, our minds, our flesh, and our conscience into alignment. We will be led by your spirit. Here we are. Fill us up. We want to live under your influence. So Father, this week... This week, we give on purpose to you. Father, we thank you for that. And Father, there are people here today that I ask that you begin to bring freedom into their lives. Right now, just bring freedom into their lives. You've already spoken that you wanted to love on them. You wanted to heal them. You wanted to restore them. So we're going to dedicate this altar time to you. We dedicate this. Our prayer partners have spent the week preparing for this moment for people to give their lives to you, for people to come and confess things before you, for us to walk in unity after you. So, Father, we dedicate this, this precious moment of response to you. With every head bowed and every eye closed. I want to ask you this morning. Who in here says the Holy Spirit's talking to me this morning. About having more of my life. Would you raise your hand. About living under the influence of him at a greater level. How many of you want to live at a greater level. Under the influence than you are right now. Would you just raise your hand. Holy Spirit's kind of talking to you. Good. Well here's what we're going to do. You may be raising your hand because you do not know Jesus. And you say I just want to know him. Good news. He's crazy about you. And you get to give your life to him today. I want you to know if you're here and you just say, I want, him to, I want him to have more of me and I want to have more of him. Good news. Today, a good God has been waiting for that decision. He wants you to have more of him. And so we're going to open these uh, altars up. Prayer partners, will you make your way forward? Let me pray over those as they make their way forward. Father, I thank you for the hands that were raised. The ones that want to give their life to you and the ones that want you to have more of them. Father, we ask that you will anoint this time. Anoint these prayer partners. That as they speak over people, as they pray over them, as we spend time in worship, you begin to move in a way that only you can. Spirit of God, draw all men unto you right now. Draw them. And so we thank you, Holy Spirit, for what you're doing. We give you praise and honor this morning in Jesus' name. Can you lift your voices and worship in Him right now? As we worship, if that's you that raised your hand, would you make your way to the front? We're going to sing His praises for just a moment longer and give an opportunity for response. If you raised your hand, come on down. We're going to clap for you. We're going to celebrate with you. We're excited for what God's doing in your life. You give life, you are love, you bring light to darkness, you give hope, you restore every heart that is broken, and great are you, Lord.
God is good. Just want to speak a blessing over this week. This what a challenge this week to go out to be led by the Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit lead us. What opportunities is going to lead us to to be a blessing to our community? Father, I just speak a blessing over these families that are represented here today. God, that we are blessed. God, in our rising up and our laying down, God, in our labor and our 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 work. God, that we would be a blessing to those around us. God, that we would be a blessing to our neighborhood. God, that we are a blessed people this morning. We're th so thankful. God, that you give your spirit to us to lead us, God. Thank you for what you're doing in community church. Thank you for what you're doing in Orange. Thank you for what you're doing in us. God, we give you honor. We give you glory. And all God's people said, amen. Have a great week. Go with God this week. If you're interested in helping with our parking lot ministry that's coming up, I'll be out right across from pastor's office over there if you want to meet with me. Thank you.
It rocks my heart. It rocks my heart. 